My name is Wallace Best, and I am serving as Interim Director of the Center for, Af for African American Studies this year. And I stand to welcome you to the annual James Baldwin Lecture, sponsored by the Center for African American Studies. Uh, we look forward to this event uh, every year. So it is wonderful to see you all here, to have you join us for what promises to be a thrilling evening of discovery or dare I say, revelation. Uh, there will be, uh, at the conclusion of the lecture and the Q&A, uh, Professor Pagels will be signing books in the lobby. We won't have books for sale, but uh, should you have a copy of one of her books, she'd be happy to sign it in the lobby after. The Baldwin Lectures honor the extraordinary legacy of James Baldwin, one of America's most powerful cultural critics and essayists, Baldwin exemplified, exemplified ways in which we might remain critically focused upon and engaged with the relationship between race and democracy in American society. With clear vision and a remarkable penchant for telling it like it is or like it was, Baldwin stood prophetic, prophetically at the gates of this society, reminding it of its promises and of its shortcomings with equal measure and with equal passion. As he put it, I love America more than any other country in the world. And exactly for that reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. His powerful words still echo, telling us that we will never get to where we are going until we reckon with where we have been. In honor of Baldwin's legacy of remembrance and his call to understand how race and notions of difference function in our democracy, this annual lecture celebrates the scholarship of distinguished Princeton faculty, of a distinguished Princeton faculty member, and provides an occasion for our intellectual community to reflect on the issues of race and ethnicity and difference and American culture from various and at times uh, unexpected perspectives. The Baldwin Lecture Series presents uh, Princeton scholars accomplished in their respective fields with the opportunity to think with others, not only about race in America, but also many other aspects of the fabric of our society that bind and at times divide us as a nation. Former lectures, lecturers have done just that. Uh, Anthony Appia spoke of the cosmopolitanism of W.E.B. Du Bois. Bonnie Brassler about diversity and scientific research. Anthony Grafton shared his insights about race in the Renaissance. And President Shirley Tillman shared hers about the meaning of race in the post-genome era. With Paul Lansky, we had a musical conversation about race. Tonight, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce this year's Baldwin Lecturer, the incomparable Elaine Pagels. Elaine Pagels is the Harrington Spear Payne Professor of Religion at Princeton, where she has established herself as one of the leading scholars of early Christianity in the US. Professor Pagels has produced scholarship of the highest quality and value during her illustrious career, winning both popular and critical acclaim for her ability to illuminate readers, for readers, the worlds found in some of the most challenging biblical and or Gnostic texts and manuscripts. The first of her books to gain national attention was the Gnostic Gospels, which won both the National Book Critics Circle Award and the National Book Award. It remains a text that generates lively debate among students, scholars, and general readers. And it accompanies many other texts of great acclaim, including The Origin of Satan, Beyond Belief, The Secret Gospel of Thomas, Reading, Jud Reading Judas and the Shaping of Christianity, and now Revelations, Visions, Prophecy, and Politics in the Book of Revelations, Book of Revelation. Professor Pagels is the recipient of many awards, including the MacArthur Fellowship, Guggenheim, and Rockefeller Fellowships, and most recently, the Howard T. Behrman Award for Distinguished Achievement in the Humanities from Princeton University. She's a master teacher and mentor a generous scholar and colleague, and a wonderful friend. 
Please let us welcome this year's James Baldwin lecturer, Professor Elaine Pagos. Thank you. I'm, I'm very happy to be here and I'm honored to be here to speak in a lectureship devoted to uh, James Baldwin, such an extraordinary writer, and especially to be invited by my own colleagues. I, I don't think there's any sweeter honor than that. Um, and this work, while not focused uh, initially on race and not specifically, it, it is about the way we classify people and the way we interpret conflict. Um, so I started with a very strange book. It's the strangest book in the Bible. It's the most controversial one. You know, there aren't any stories in it. There aren't ethical teachings. All you find are, are visions. They're nightmares and dreams. So just in case you haven't read it lately, I thought I'd, I'd sort of give you a quick <laughs> run through with a kind of sort of cliff notes version along with some of the art that it's inspired to give a sense of its cultural impact. So it starts as the writer, he says his name is John, we don't know much else about him, he calls himself John. He's called John of Patmos because he's writing from a small island off the coast of Turkey. And he said he was in the spirit, which probably means in an ecstatic trance one day when suddenly he heard a loud voice behind him and he turned around and to his shock he saw what he thought was a divine being speaking to him. And, and John uh, was one of the followers of Jesus of Nazareth who had been crucified in Jerusalem about 60 years earlier and he thought this divine being was Jesus alive again speaking to him. And this is a, one image, this is a contemporary image of John receiving the message. And John said, after this voice spoke, uh, it promised, uh, Jesus promised, he thought, to tell you what must take place after this. And John said, then he looked up in the sky and he saw a door open. And a voice said, come up here. And he went up, um, he went up into the heavens and he said he was allowed to see what the prophet Ezekiel had seen hundreds of years earlier. Uh, he said he, he saw the divine throne and, and uh, what he saw on the throne of God, as, as Ezekiel had described, was light. He saw lightning and fire, sapphires and rainbows and, and dazzling jewels. Uh, the, the, what, what in Hebrew is called the glory of God, the, the, the shining of God. And next to the throne, he said he saw a slaughtered lamb who began to open the seven seals of the future. John said, after this, he watched... And he saw four horsemen come forth, uh, and the first one on a white horse was given permission to slaughter a third of the inhabitants of the earth. The second one on a fiery red horse brought death and destruction all over the world. The third on a black horse brought famine. And the, the fourth uh, brought death and destruction by wild animals and natural catastrophes. <laughs> well, what happened? <laughs> wow. We got, we got to a whole place. I don't know how to get back now. <laughs> I don't think this was part of the story. So how do we do that? <laughs> well, we better get back. This is just flipped to the end. Sorry about that. So we'll try again because I'd like to show you what the images are. Them? No? Oh, come on. <laughs> I really need this. Which one do you need? Ah. Uh, come down. This one? Below that. Anywhere. Well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> that was not what was in the prophecy. Ah, well, we'll try again. Maybe I hit the wrong button. So John said that after this, he, he looked under the throne of God and he saw 
the souls of those who'd been slaughtered for the witness of God, and they were crying out in a loud voice. And what they cried was, was this. They cried, Lord, how long? How long before you judge and avenge our blood on the people of the earth? And John said, as if in answer to their cry, a star fell from heaven and a huge army of beasts came from under the abyss with sort of uh, women's hair and strange faces led by Abaddon, the angel of the abyss. And John said, it was soon after that that he looked up in, in the sky again and there were two great signs. One was a woman clothed with the sun, hugely pregnant, writhing in the pain of childbirth. She's about to give birth to the Messiah. And stalking her is a great red dragon. He's not as red as he should be in this version, but he's stalking the woman, hoping to devour the child the moment that it's born. And when the child is born, uh, John said he watched as it was ca caught up into, into heaven and the woman was given wings to fly off to the desert and protected by God. And the beast was frustrated and furious and stormed up into heaven to fight a war with Michael and his angels. The beast had his own angels. And finally, Michael, the archangel, won the battle and threw uh, the other angel out with all of his angels down on earth, the one who became the beast. And John said that at that, the beast was furious, and he went off to make war on the woman and all her children on earth. And John said after that, he watched, and the beast brought forth two great monsters as his allies. Uh, these are the way William Blake pictures them. Uh, in Jewish mythology, these are a male and female pair, Behemoth and Leviathan. And John said that the, the beast uh, brought forth this ally, who is the beast from the sea with seven heads and crowns on all of its heads. Uh, and this one was given power to dominate the entire world. Then he said he saw a second beast. Uh, this is the great red beast on top. And the great red beast was, uh, was given a human number, he said, a mysterious number. And you know what the number is, right? It's 666. So after that, John said he, he looked up in heaven again, and he saw seven angels. And each angel had an enormous bowl, golden bowl. And each angel poured the contents of the bowl, which was the wrath of God, down on earth as trumpets blew. And the sixth angel poured the wrath of God right over the Tigris-Euphrates River, where they meet right over Israel's ancient enemy, Babylon. Um, and as he did so, there were explosions of great noise and light, and people died on earth, cursing God in agony. John pictured Israel's ancient enemy, Babylon, uh, in, as, as a great whore sitting on a great red beast. Um, she doesn't look so bad here, but <laughs> this is a 15th century painting. Um, however, it's, it's interesting, you see, that the, the kind of dualistic view that John presents uh, everything cast into the images of good and evil in this apocalyptic vision uh, as opposites, you see that the heads of the beast here are, in fact, painted by this Belgian painter, black. And so that's, you see that race also slips in when you get this kind of dichotomy. So this is a picture of uh, the whore of Babylon who images the great empire that Israel hated. This is a contemporary version of the whore of Babylon. She is drinking from a golden cup. And John says what she drinks is the blood of innocent people. Um, now the cosmic war is coming toward its climax at this point. Uh, John says that After this, uh, Christ came, and you see here again, you have that image of Christ uh, as a blonde, this is William Blake's version, with the serpent uh, as a dark figure. Uh, so Jesus comes forth to, to tie the beast and put him into captivity for a thousand years. Um, and John says, at that point, the Son of Man, Jesus, returns from heaven with all the armies of heaven to fight the great battle of Armageddon.
And then the forces are joined and they join in battle and, and all the people who oppose God are slaughtered in a great heap of corpses um, while the just uh, are raised from the dead to face the final judgment of God. And Jesus comes to judge the living and the dead. This is one version. Uh, this is another of the righteous on the left and the damned being thrown into the, the fiery eternal uh, torment that burns forever, as John says. Now, go back a minute. Sorry about that. That's not going to work. So you might be wondering, who was John and what was he thinking? <laughs> it's, it's quite a story. And, you know, this is a very hard book to interpret famously, famously complicated, and I certainly won't pretend to do it in a few minutes. But it does help to know that this is wartime literature, right? This is, this is the writing of somebody who has experienced and seen a terrible, devastating war that destroyed his people in Judea when, uh, when Jewish fighters re rebelled against the Roman Empire that dominated Judea uh, from about the year 66 of the first century. And, and the Romans sent in 60,000 troops to quell the revolution. It was a terrible, devastating war in which the Romans came in and finally uh, besieged the city, starved the inhabitants, destroyed the city when they finally won. And they, they went into the center of the city in the great temple of God, which was the whole center of Jerusalem, and, and destroyed it, threw down the great stones from the temple. And if you've been to Jerusalem, you, you've seen even today the pile of rubble that the Roman soldiers left with stones about as big as a quarter of this room that they threw down when they destroyed the great temple of God and then set it to fire and desecrated it. Now, John was apparently a refugee from this war in Judea. And he traveled into Asia Minor, devastated about what had happened to his people. Um, but. Uh, like other Jews, he was horrified by the war, of course, but he was also perhaps excited because he was also a follower of Jesus, and he believed that Jesus, 30 years earlier, had predicted all these things, these very unlikely things, you know, unimaginable events, the destruction of Jerusalem and his people. But if you look at the Gospel of, of Mark, um, John had believed that Jesus had predicted all of these terrible things in war and, and said all these things must happen, to war and catastrophe, destruction of the city, violence, and then the Son of Man will come, the kingdom of God will come with power. So that's why John would have been both horrified and excited because the unimaginable had happened. You know, I always think if someone had predicted in, in the 1970s that the World Trade Towers would be destroyed by fire from heaven in minutes. I mean, it would be impossible, right? But, but then if somebody had predicted it in 1970 and it happened, they would think about the person who had predicted it, perhaps. And in this case, I think John thought about, Jesus predicted it and it happened. That means now the kingdom will come. So John and other followers of Jesus began to write about and preach the message of Jesus, and, and they went throughout the world waiting for the time when Jesus would return and justice would prevail again. But, but we know from the story that John waited for 10 years, and then 15 years, and 20 years, and 30 years. And when he traveled through Asia Minor, this, through the great city of Ephesus, he would have seen everywhere that the kingdom that had come with power was not the kingdom of God. It was Rome's. And he could have seen if he walked into the city of Ephesus a statue 20 times as high as a human being of, of, of the reigning emperor. His name is Domitian. Domitian's father, actually, Vespasian, had been the military commander and later the emperor who led the troops into Jerusalem and devastated and besieged the city. And Domitian's brother, Titus, also later emperor, had been the one whose soldiers torched and destroyed the entire center of the city and left it a pile of charred rubble with corpses strewn all over the city. 
And now the brother, Domitian, is ruling the world. He would have seen that that was the kingdom that had come. And if he had gone to the city of Aphrodisias, which is a not, not a maybe half a day's walk from, from Ephesus, he would have seen a huge temple. You could see this walking from miles away, about two miles away. You'd see this enormous temple on top of the hill, and you, it would be in the image of architecture pioneered by Augustus at the beginning of the first century. This architecture was called the Sebastion, that is the Temple of the Holy Ones, and it pictures all of the Roman emperors and the glory of imperial Rome. This was a kind of imperial propaganda for the Roman Empire. What he would have seen was Augustus himself, this is Augustus, pictured naked to show that he's among the gods, ruling over land and sea. And then if you walked around the temple, you would see 30 different panels, huge, each of them, probably as, as big as this whole uh, side of the, of, the, of the wall. And each one would show an image like this. This is Emperor Claudius lifting a sword to slit the throat of a naked female slave whom he's humiliating. And this slave represents Britain because that's the way Roman artists pictured the nations that they conquered. This is their typical uh, art form. The next panel would show Emperor Nero uh, forcing to the ground a naked female slave who represents Armenia. And then you could walk around 30 panels and you'd see all the nations that Rome had conquered and you were supposed to be truly impressed. <laughs> Unless maybe you were John, who belonged to one of those captive nations which was pictured on coins that the Roman Empire issued called Judea Capta, captured Judea a female naked slave humiliated um, by the great power that was Rome. Now, it's not long after John was in that part of the world that he began, uh, he said he heard a voice from heaven and he began to speak about prophecy. He said he had visions that the God of Israel was going to destroy the forces of evil once and for all. Uh, John said that... Um, what he, what he saw were these visions which we've seen. So what John did in the book of Revelation, on one level at least, and there are many others we could discuss, is he took the resources of his own people's culture, which were the prophetic writings, the writings of Isaiah and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, um, and, and other prophets, and he, he took their ancient story of how the God of Israel had fought a great dragon at the beginning of time. This is a story that comes from Babylonian mythology. But the God of Israel is also said to have fought the great dragon they call Rahab or Leviathan. The dragon has many names. Um, and the prophets who were suffering uh, war and devastation of their people Israel uh, much earlier had, had said, yes, and and the, the, the forces of evil that conquered our people, they are the monsters. They are the dragons. So the prophet uh, Jeremiah pictures Israel's enemy as a monster and a beast that God will spear like a serpent and, and, and run through and kill. Uh, the prophet Isaiah talks about, uh, calls on the Lord to wake up and kill the great dragon. Uh, which in his mind was not some primordial mythological dragon. It was the embodiment of the evil forces that allowed the Babylonians to destroy his people. So what John did was update the prophecies for his own time and say, well, yes, and Rome, which is as, as monstrous as Babylon or Egypt, the ancient enemies of Israel, as decadent as the whore uh, that the prophets saw as Babylon. This monster, too, is about to be destroyed when God comes and destroys the forces of evil. Well, I first encountered this book of Revelation um, with some power when I was about 14 years old, and I actually went to an evangelical revival uh, in California, much to my parents' horror, 
I loved it. <laughs> the singing, the intensity, the power of it, it, it was very moving and very uh, overwhelming and, and, and powerful. And so I went right into it. Um, and I joined an evangelical church and participated in it. These are people who read the book of Revelation a lot, read the Bible all the time. And, um, and I was deeply part of it for about a year. It was like falling in love when you're 14. And then a year is a long time <laughs> when you're 14. And well, at, at a certain point, members of the church told me that one of my friends was going to hell because he was Jewish. And I thought it was odd. I mean, Jesus was Jewish. <laughs> but anyway, it made no sense to me. So I decided I had to leave that group, and I did, and had nothing to do with it after that, and went off for other things. But a few years later, I was still thinking uh, about what is it that was so powerful about that experience? I was brought up with scientists. My parents had given up religion, the sort of Protestant religion of my father's family and my mother's family. My father gave it up for Darwin and became a biologist. So I was brought up and told, well, you know, religion's going to die off when people get scientifically educated enough. We won't need these old folk tales anymore. Um, and so it will disappear. But I had encountered it as something quite powerful. I didn't know whether it was Christianity or whether it was simply the power of religious imagination, which I'd never encountered in that way before. So I, I kept thinking, what is it about that? I want to understand that. There's something there that I need to discover, if possible, find out why that was, why I had to join that group and why I had to leave it also. So I went off to graduate school to study um, the beginnings of Christianity, and I was imagining that I could find out about what Jesus thought on the hills of Galilee and so forth, kind of a romantic view that draws people into that field. But to my great surprise, my professors had file cabinets full of gospels I had never heard of, like the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of Philip and the Gospel of Mary, as well as the New Testament gospels. And so I, I, I got, as you see, completely fascinated by that. But they also had, I now thought, other books of Revelation, lots of books of Revelation. So what is this book of Revelation uh, doing in the New Testament? How did it get there? And, and what are those other Revelations like? Because we now know that this one is not unique. This was written about 2,000 years ago, but dozens of others have now been unearthed that were also written about the same time. And some of these other books of Revelation um, are quite remarkable. And that's why I gave you a handout, which gives you a sort of hors d'oeuvres of books of Revelation. <laughs> these are just little samples. But it's, it's striking to see that this is a whole genre of literature. The first one on this is another book called The Revelation of Ezra. This is written exactly at the same time John writes. And the writer says he's writing in Babylon. And when he says Babylon, it's code. He means Rome, that evil city. Um, he's writing in Babylon, and he says he is writing because he was weeping every night. He could not sleep because he was so troubled about the destruction uh, of his city, the destruction of his people. And, and he prays and weeps and cries out for God's justice, and God finally sends an angel to him. Uh, and it's, it's kind of a, amusing. I mean, the angel says, well, I'll, I'll ask you three riddles. And if you tell me the answer, I'll tell you everything you want to know. So the riddles are, go and weigh fire. Measure the wind and bring yesterday back. And Ezra, to his credit, doesn't try. He just <laughs> says, he just says, why did God give us a mind with understanding if we, if we live in such suffering and we die like this. He said, I, I don't understand. He said, I, I would rather, we, we, we don't understand why we suffer. Um, and it's a very moving book, I must tell you, and we can't speak about it much. But Ezra, who wrote it, it's also a pseudonym, um, 
it was a was a Jewish prophet like John, and he's not a follower of Jesus, but he does talk about the coming of the Messiah, the coming of God's justice, the day of judgment, very similar themes. The other ones, some of these were found with the secret gospels. And I just put a few little excerpts. One is the revelation of Zostrianos, which is, I just love the opening of this. It's about a young man whose name is Zostrianos. He's also Jewish. And he says he kept asking questions. And he couldn't understand what was going on with his life, seeking a resting place for my spirit. He said he was so deeply troubled and despairing that he decided there was nothing to do, but he would go and kill himself. So he went into the desert to kill himself. And he said suddenly, as he steeled himself to do so, he said he was aware that there was a luminous presence. And this presence spoke to him and said, Zostrianos, have you gone mad? <laughs> and he said, and then he, was, then he was illuminated by this presence. And then he says, I, I love this line, he says, then he came to understand that the power in me was greater than the darkness because it contained the whole light. Very moving. Another revelation text which I find very powerful is called Thunder, um, Perfect Mind or Complete Mind. This is a poem spoken in the voice of a feminine power. She says, I have come forth from the power and so forth. I am the first and the last. I am the honored one and scorned. I am the whore and I am the holy one. Uh, and it goes on, it's quite a long poem. She embodies all the figures of divine wisdom, uh, of the goddess Isis, of the power of the divine, but she also embodies the opposite. Uh, it's a very moving poem. She says, Don't, do not be arrogant to me when I'm cast out on the earth. Do not look upon me on the dung heap. Do not cast me out among those who are slain in violence and so forth. I am the one they call life and you have called death. On one level she is Eve, the woman who is called Eve is named, the name of course means life in Hebrew and they call her the origin of death. Uh, this poem, by the way, has been, has been played and used by many women artists. Toni Morrison wrote several songs and I didn't know where they were and I, amazing song and when I heard the song she said, oh, well, you know, it's thunder. You told me about it. And, and it's a poem that she used, thunder. She changed a couple words. There are four poems now in Firestone Library uh, in a little book that Tony uh, wrote of poems that come from thunder, perfect mind. Um, also, the Native American writer Leslie Marmon Silco wrote a novel in which the discovery of this poem is the treasure that is the sought in that novel. Uh, it's also used, as some of you will know, um, by the filmmaker Julie Dash in her film Daughters of the Dust. Uh, it's, it's a remarkable poem. And then if you look at other revelations, the secret revelation of John, you notice there's something about these revelations uh, here. They are not about the end of time. They're not about the day of judgment. They're not about what the book of Revelation is about. These are about spiritual breakthrough. They're more like what, um, the, what William James wrote about in his famous book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, when he talks about spiritual breakthrough. What Zostrianos writes, um, for example, that sometimes people have experiences of deep revelation. And the other thing about these other books of Revelation, which fascinate me, you can't really generalize about them because they're so different from one another, but there's one thing you could say. They're not about dividing the human race between the saved and the damned, the good and the evil. They really have a much more universal vision. For example, like the secret revelation of John. Uh, John says to Jesus in this revelation, this is not Jesus of Nazareth, this is, this is the divine being to whom he's speaking after the death of Jesus. The, the living Jesus, the one who appears in, in the, the other revelation. And he says, Christ, will the souls of everyone live in the pure light? And in the secret revelation of John, which we never knew about before a few decades ago, Jesus says, yes, 
you know, if, if people did not have the spirit of God, they could not even stand up. So everyone has access to the spirit of God. It's a different kind of message. Um, finally, there's a little one from the text called Trimorphic Protonoia, which means in Greek, the triple formed primal thought. And it's the thought that everyone has, according to this author, the thought that you and I have. It's supposed to be the thought of God, which comes before everything else. And here she speaks, she's called Protonoia because that's uh, the gender of the Greek word. And she says, I shone down on the waters. I poured the water forth. This is Genesis. I am hidden within the radiant waters. I am the one who gradually brought forth all things. I am the real voice, and I cry out in everyone. So you see that theme uh, in all of these texts. But as you know, what happened, and I was trying to figure out, well, why is John's book of Revelation the one that gets into the collection that we know as the Bible? And that is a complicated question. But we see some people loved John's book, and some people said it was unintelligible, it was bizarre, it wasn't really a revelation at all. But the people who loved John's book in the early Christian movement were the people who were getting arrested, who knew about other Christians being tortured, being beheaded, uh, being torn apart in public spectacles. Um, they were suffering horrendous uh, persecution at the hands of the Roman Empire. And those people loved John's book because it talked about the power of Rome, an overwhelming power that will finally be destroyed um, in the promise of God and justice prevail. And so by the fourth century, uh, bishops of the church, uh, some of them, sought to suppress the other books of Revelation, saying, well, they're not all wrong, but they will certainly lead you astray. And one thing they might lead you to believe is that you could find God without the church. You could find God in your own heart. You could find God in your unconscious mind as the primary thought, which is there before all other thought and so forth. But anyway, these were all suppressed, declared heretical, um, and the book of Revelation eventually became part of the canon. But before we open up a discussion, I was thinking to me, another important question is, why is it that people still read these prophecies? And how do they do that? Because, you know, if you know about John's book in the first century, you know he's talking about quite specific people, quite specific situations. So when he talks about the beast with the human number and the thrones on its head, you know that he's talking about the emperor and, he's, and the, na the mysterious number, 666. You could figure out, he sort of dares you to figure out that it, it refers to the imperial name of what everybody thought was the worst emperor, Nero, uh, that it's Nero's name hidden in that cryptogram. Um, and sort of referred to in that mysterious way. And then when John talks about a great mountain that explodes and falls into the ocean, pollutes the, the, uh, the sea, he's probably talking about the explosion of the volcano, Mount Vesuvius, happened about 10 years before he wrote. And he thought, this is a sign of the time, and other Jewish prophets said the same. Uh, when he's talking about the whore, well, you know he's talking about the goddess Roma, who was pictured on every coin, uh, looking very much like uh, the powerful queen uh, that is pictured in uh, in his uh, pictured in his prophecies. But it may be because it was dangerous for a Jewish prophet to openly denounce Rome. Whatever the reason, I think it's because he drew upon prophetic imagery as a prophet himself. He he. He spoke about all those immediate situations in a very graphic, imaginative way. And it's because the symbols are so wide open, as you see, monsters, whores, beasts, that people can plug into them almost any conflict and almost any situation, whether it's social, political, um, religious, whatever it is. So I just uh, gave, wanted to give you a sample of a few of the ways people have read this book. Uh, oh, that's another picture of 
the devil and the damned. This is a 15th century image when, when a plague was going through Europe um, and killing a third of the population of Europe. You see here the parade of corpses. And, and the, the artist sees this as the coming of the first horseman of the apocalypse. Like this plague, when 30% of the people in, this, in the city and the town are dying, this must be the beginning of the end of time. When Martin Luther's uh, revolution split Christian churches throughout Europe, um, he at first didn't like the book of Revelation. In 1522, he said, there's no Christ in it. It shouldn't be in the, in, in the canon at all. But by 1530, he'd figured out how he could use it against the Catholic Church. And so in the early Luther Bibles, you get pictures in the book of Revelation just so you know who the beast is. And in case you can't see the beast close up enough, it is the, the uh, Bishop of Rome, the Pope of Rome, the Catholic Pope. Uh, with the mitre. And so this is put in all the Luther Bibles so that you as a Lutheran Christian would know uh, the identity of the great beast. The first Catholic biographer of Luther pictured Luther himself as the seven-headed beast. <laughs> and so the retaliation continues. This is Napoleon, um, as the beloved son of the devil. Um, pictured in anti-Napoleonic propaganda. And during the time of the American Civil War, uh, this book was read, as it often has been, by people on all sides. This is a Southern political cartoon showing Lincoln being strangled by the beast that is the Union. Um, it was read, of course, on the other side by abolitionists like um, John Brown and uh, and many others, uh, they interpret it in a, in a totally different way. As you can imagine, seeing those that stand under the throne of God and cry out, how long, O oh Lord, how long before you judge and avenge our blood on the people of the earth? And they read that as the, the, the people who had been enslaved crying out to God for justice. And this, oops. I wanted to go back and can we get this music? You know this music. This is what Julia Ward Howe, looking at the Union Army, uh, went with the armies and wrote this famous battle hymn. The language is straight out of the book of Revelation. So that, that hymn, so powerfully sung at the inauguration recently, was, was a northern uh, reading of the book of Revelation where the terrible slaughter of that war was read as God's punishment for the sin of slavery. Um, this is Babylon pictured as Lon uh, London, or London pictured as Babylon. Uh, Thomas Hobbes also wrote Leviathan about contemporary society as the, the beast incarnate. During World War II, the same book of Revelation was played on both sides. That's the significant part of it. You see here, this, you know this artist? This is Dr. Seuss. <laughs> Dr. Seuss pictures Hitler as the great beast. And in fact, uh, Hitler's propaganda minister, Yusuf Goebbels, uh, developed a whole propaganda campaign for Christian Lutherans and Catholics uh, showing that Hitler was bringing in the Dritte Reich, the third kingdom, the great kingdom of Christ, while ridding the world of undesirables as Hitler saw it before that would happen. Uh, and at the same time, of course, it was read on the other side. This music you may know, um, would you? This? this music was composed in a German prison camp in 1941 by the French composer Olivier Messiaen, who was imprisoned there. It was a freezing winter, and things were going very badly for the Allies. And he said he walked, one day he, he looked out and he saw a rainbow. 
And he thought of the angel uh, in the book of Revelation who stands with one foot on the land and one on the sea. And the angel says, there shall be no more time. And Messian wrote the quartet for the end of time because he thought there might be no more time. Uh, and it was played first by prisoners, for prisoners and for the guards in the camp. Uh, an amazing piece of music. Oops, that's not working now. Ah, oh, this is uh, an operation you might remember. Shock and awe. Um, American bombs over Baghdad. You know why it's titled like this? Somebody was thinking about the sixth angel of the book of Revelation who's delivering God's wrath right over Babylon, which happens to be Baghdad. And there are explosions and light, just the way it says in the book of Revelation. And people on earth uh, die in agony. Uh, and the American bombs are delivering um, shock to unbelievers and awe to those who understand. Right? And so we see it still plays out. But that's not the only way the book of Revelation is read. I mean, it is often read, and that's what I wanted to explore, is the way it could be read on both sides, just because the images are so wide open. Um, it can be read uh, by both sides against one another, exactly as we see. There were also people who used it not so much in wartime, but people who were uh, saw the book of Revelation as a book of promise about about hope, about hope for God's justice. And as you uh, may know, in African-American tradition, there's a long tradition of preaching and music and writing uh, that speaks about the coming of that glorious new kingdom. This is a work of art I saw in New York um, in the Guggenheim Museum, I believe it's now in the Smithsonian, by James Hampton. And he created in a garage out of cardboard and aluminum foil a throne for God and a throne for the Lamb of God. He calls himself director of special projects for the third millennium. Um, and he has done some amazing art. And, and with that, just a reminder of one of the many uh, songs that comes from this book. Some of you may know about John the Revelator. By that are riding, that are riding. Okay, so with that, I'll stop and open up our discussion. Thank you. Well, this book, this book has a problematic history in terms of canon. Um, actually, this is the most complicated story in, in, in canon. This isn't just about the Eastern Orthodox, but if we have, I don't know if you have the image on it. Can we get the next one? This is one of the earliest New Testament canon. You know, there wasn't a hundred years of the Christian movement. It wasn't until the fourth century and the end of the fourth century that the books of the New Testament were actually entirely assembled after Constantine had become a Christian and authorized the production of uh, a scripture for this new, now, state Christian church. And one of his close allies and trusted bishops, Eusebius of Caesarea, who wrote the first history of the church, wrote a list of recognized books and a list of disputed books. And you see that the, the recognized books are almost all the books you would recognize if you know the New Testament. And then at the end, he says, and well, um, yeah, the book of Revelation, if you think it belongs there. And then at the list of disputed books, there's not a book you would recognize if you, if you know the New Testament. And at the end of that, he says, and uh, the book of Revelation. Some people reject it. but So this is the only book, in response to your question, the only book that is mentioned on both lists because it was so disputed. So some people loved it and some people hated it. And also, 
I have one more. When you look at the early canon lists from the fourth century, this is from the year 350 to 400. This is what we have. The Bishop of Jerusalem leaves Revelation out and says, whatever books uh, are not read in church, do not read even by yourself. <laughs> and we have five lists. Um, and, and they all leave Revelation out except one. This is my favorite, the fourth one. He says, he leaves Revelation out and he has all the other New Testament books and he says, this is the least falsified canon of the New Testament, of the divinely inspired scriptures. So you know there was a lot of argument about certain books. There was no argument over any book more intense than this one. It's only the Bishop of Egypt who was organizing an ecclesiastical structure in a very particular way who put it on his list and reinterpreted the beast and the whore um, as heresy. Oh, it's, a, it's a feminine word, so it kind of works um, that way. <laughs> but in the Eastern churches, as you say, it's never, uh, it hasn't been used and authorized to be read in church, which is what a canon is for. So it's the only book of its kind of a sort of ambiguous status. So it's always been odd, and it's been fascinating to me to see how disputed this book is. Yes? Does the author of uh, Revelation send God out to John? Well, yes, that's what tradition says. You know, the tradition, church tradition says that the author of Revelation was a disciple of Jesus, John of Zebedee. But that wasn't until the second century. And John, who wrote the book of Revelation, never says that never suggests that at all. In fact, he writes really late. So most people don't agree. In the third century, the Bishop of Egypt, not the same one, an earlier Bishop of Egypt, said they can't be written by the same person because they're written in entirely different style. Um, the book of, the Gospel of John is written in rather elegant Greek. This book is written by somebody whose original language is not Greek, it's Aramaic or Hebrew. And he uses a lot of Aramaic or Hebrew idioms translated into a slightly awkward Greek of somebody whose first language it isn't. It's a very different kind of book. But when it was said to be written by a heretic by some, others retaliated and said, no, 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 it was written by a disciple. So this made it um, kosher, you know, it got into the canon because it was written by a disciple. Some people thought that was good enough. Yes. Yes. This poem. This is probably a second century poem. And she says here, I am the wisdom of the Greeks and I am honored among the barbarians. Um, and I have no image among, I'm, uh, I'm the, what did she say? I am, whose image is great in Egypt, and I have no image among the barbarians. Um, her image was probably the image of Isis. But she is also a figure that embodies these biblical images of Eve, and also wisdom, which in Hebrew is chokmah, or ruach, or shekinah. That is, this, the sense of the presence of God, the imminent presence of God in much of biblical literature and later mystical tradition is understood as a feminine presence, whereas the transcendence of God is understood as masculine and sort of beyond the world. But the wisdom of God, the, the presence of God, the spirit of God, which is in the world, is spoken of as feminine. And so these various texts speak in that kind of a voice of wisdom. Uh, they're feminine words in Hebrew, also in Greek, actually. Yes? Uh, I've read the, the whole emphasis on in evangelical Christianity is relatively new phenomenon that came about sometime in the middle of the 19th century. Am I on the right track about that? Well, it's interesting. I guess what kind of thing are you thinking that? I, I thought there was the, the whole rapture concept. Oh, the rapture. Well, the rapture is not in this book, actually. The rapture comes from a letter attributed to Paul, which talks about meeting the Lord in the air. It's not in this book, and it was later read into Christianity at the beginning of the 20th century, actually. I believe that's correct. Uh, Professor Paris can correct me. Is that right? Uh, I think so. Pardon me? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> so 
so that isn't there, but actually what's fascinating is that when people are reading it in the second century and the third century or reading in the time of Augustine, if you ask them, where are we in the timetable for the end time? What will they say? Right before the end. We're almost there. If you look on the internet, you'll see people timing it. We're almost there. And, and that's almost, and that's because the book is written with a tremendous urgency because I think John was deeply, passionately convinced that if God was going to bring justice and if Jesus' prophecy was true as he deeply believed, you know, it would come and it would come soon because Jesus had said it would come within a generation and almost two generations had gone. And he wanted to um, emphasize and, and voice the hope that it would come. Uh, and so it's always spoken to that. But it's, it's been read about the end times since it was written. Yes? You mean these? Or? Yeah, the more recent ones yes. that were discovered. Were they written and translated recently out of their native uh, language? Which, what, what, what? Yes, the language in which these texts were written is Greek, because people who wrote around the first century, if they could write Greek, they probably would, because it was read by so many people. You know, So the book of Revelation is written in Greek, even by somebody, as I said, his language was Aramaic or Hebrew, but he wanted he wanted it to be read widely in Asia Minor and Turkey and Syria and the countries where he was traveling. I mean, those countries didn't exist in that form at the time. They called it Asia Minor. But these were all written in Greek, and they're all written within about that time frame. So there's an outpouring of revelation books at that time. That's what I found so fascinating. And they were all in Greek. Yes. And we have them, found them, only because the bishops ordered them destroyed. They were found in Egypt where papyrus doesn't rot, uh, in copies translated into Coptic, which is the Egyptian language. So all we have are translations from most of these. But they're still very intriguing. And I think, you know, they have a different, a different vision of the human race. I mean, I think those who have suffered the kind of violence and, and oppression and, and, and war that John had experienced have often uh, felt very deeply the passion with which he writes his prophecy and the hope for God's justice. Um, and, and, you know, I think somebody in that situation understands very well why he wrote the way he did. Um, but these are written with a different kind of vision of humankind. And it didn't really fit the church when, when part of the message was that if you're not orthodox, uh, you will go into that lake of fire. And that was part of the message in the fourth century. That's not in the book, of course. But even now, if you go into many churches in Europe, you know, you, you think about what, what, what happens when you walk out the back door. Very often when you walk out the door, you will see uh, the last judgment. So you remember as you depart from the church, <laughs> don't forget. <laughs> <laughs> the side you have to be on, on that day, right? So it serves as a warning. Yes. Yeah, um, yes. You know, the, it's, you cannot really date those kinds of things. I mean, he may well have been on Patmos, and I mean, I think it's very likely that's where he was, and, and, uh, and there was a temple uh, to the goddess Artemis right there uh, who might have become a model for, for the whore, uh, those, one of those Roman Greek goddesses. But about the authenticity of, of the sites that are shown, I don't think anybody knows. They probably don't go back that far, I would think, but who knows? Yes?
that's very interesting. And maybe tell me what you see. Because when I've been talking with students about this, they see it, of course, in films. It's in music. It's in country music. It's in popular music. It's in, it's in rap music. I mean, uh, you know, the coming of the end time, the judgment. There's a lot of, uh, of music and art and film and writing. I'm thinking, I'm sure you can think of examples. And, and maybe you can bring some up. What? I don't know Ghostbusters. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. But it's a very powerful kind of vision. In fact, this apocalyptic um, narrative about the forces of good and the forces of evil coming to a violent clash and finally the good will prevail narrowly over the forces of evil is really the structure of a lot of drama, particularly children's drama. I mean, like Lord of the Rings or, um, you know, the Wizard of Oz and, and many others have that kind of structure. Yes? Yes, they can. And with this prophecy, I think it was a problem, though. I mean, John had prophesied that the Roman Empire would fall apart and be destroyed by Christ. In fact, it became a Christian empire. And, and Constantine, the victor, took the book of Revelation and pictured himself as, as sort of the, the emissary of Christ destroying the monster, which was his political enemy, actually, whom he killed. So, and he had a picture of that right over his palace in Jerusalem. So interestingly, the prophecy failed. But what happened is Athanasius, who put this on his list, showed people to say, well, you don't have to read it literally to take it seriously. You can apply it to other situations. So he pictured it in very different ways and as his, his, his own political enemies became, uh, became the beast and the whore. At first, he couldn't write about the Roman emperor that way because he wouldn't have had a position as bishop as perhaps the richest man in Alexandria if he hadn't had the bishop's approval. I mean, sorry, the emperor's approval, Constantine. But after Constantine died, uh, his son uh, deposed Athanasius and threw him out and put another bishop in and sent him into exile. And finally, after 25 years of trying to get back, he, uh, Athanasius wrote letters to the monks all over Egypt explaining that the Antichrist, the beast, was actually Constantine's son, this Christian emperor who didn't like him. So you could replay the images and, and they became recyclable in a particular way. Yes, Professor Paris. I was thinking that as you were speaking that um, almost every funeral I've ever attended in the African American uh, context, uh, Revelation 21 yes. is invariably read. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, yes. the first heaven and church earth and possibly and so forth. And, uh, but nobody has ever preached on it. <laughs> nobody ever preaches on it. But yet I think yeah. it's, it, it has a wonderful pictorial effect. Yes. And in terms of looking um, towards the, the, sort of the eschaton or something. Like that. Yes, it does. It, it, is a, it is a very beautiful image. That is, John is an amazing writer. And I began to realize. The book has a lot about fear, but it's also about hope. It's also about, I mean, you know, it's, I was thinking, it's, it's like the author takes all of your worst nightmares about war and destruction and chaos and catastrophe and, and plague and just says, well, just sort of wrap them into one huge nightmare in the book of Revelation. Everything horrifying happens. But at the end, it's not destruction. At the end, suddenly a new world comes, descends from heaven, and God's light lights up the whole city, and God wipes the tear from every eye. It's a very powerful image. So instead of ending in, in disaster, it ends with this glorious scene of hope. So I think it deeply appeals to all of us when, or can, in situations of, of desolation, or terror, or destruction, uh, or death, and say, yes, but at the end of all that darkness, there's there's this enormous new vision of, of God's life. So I'm glad you brought that up, because I think it's 
one of the powerful parts of the appeal of this book, that it has that element of hope. Yes? In non-Christian traditions, I, well, there are a lot that I don't know about. In, in Islam, though, I believe there are scenes about the judgment day and the end of time. Um, I don't know enough about that. I wish I did. Uh, and of course, this all comes from Jewish apocalyptic because that's where the tradition is rooted. John would not have seen himself, I suggest, as a Christian. He would have seen himself as a prophet, a Jewish prophet, who followed Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, and saw Jesus as the manifestation of God's uh, coming into the world and, and his prophecy. I was thinking more of Eastern religions. Eastern religions, can somebody speak to that? Because I don't know how actually comparable there are. I mean, there are many worlds and, and uh, cycles of worlds in other religions, but perhaps someone will speak to that. Oh, yes. The great, dragon, the great dragon devours the earth at the end in Valhalla. It collapses. And so we can add sort of quote, quote, Is that the end? It just, the, the snake de time. devours everything, and that's it? Nothing afterwards? <laughs> <laughs> I'd, prefer, I'd take this one. <laughs> that's interesting. That's interesting. Yes. Yes. Images of uh, women as uh, in source of impurity and so forth. Is that in part of the you know, problem, I mean, the, the difficulty in early Christianity about celibacy and so forth? Well, it probably is. I mean, this book, many women have written about it, and feminists have written about this book as a, as a misogynist, you know, book, because the only images of women, as you see, there's, there's the whore, and there's the Holy One, the Bride of Christ, who is totally pure. And then there's the one who's totally debauched. And that's what you get, is these very divided images. Now, if you look at thunder, you see the opposite. And I think that's why it appeals to artists and, and to many women who see that this poem can encompass all of being, not just the good parts, supposedly or the evil parts, or the sensuality as evil, and all of that, that becomes dichotomized in exactly that way. So there are many people who've, who really are concerned about that kind of imagery, and I'm interested that thunder, in a way, reverses it. It's a really important point. Thank you. Yeah. Yes? Um, what, what sort of response, if any, have evangelicals had to this discovery of the other revelations? Do they They don't like them. <laughs> and, and of course, they will say, well, these aren't scripture. And they're not. You know, they're not. They're revelation texts. They're esoteric texts, many of them. Some of them look like Buddhist texts. They're about how to discover the divine within, how to discover the divine, uh, and the suggestion that you can find that somehow by looking. You can find it within you. You can find it anywhere. Out in the desert, you can find it on the dung heap, as Thunder says, or wherever. Um, and that, that kind of revelation is not welcome among people who say there's only one way, and we know what that is, and we have it, and you don't. So uh, much as I appreciated, in some ways, what that evangelical church taught me, I think it has real limits. Well, yes, although the book doesn't say that. It just talks about the coming of the end time. One thing that strikes me about it, though, you know, the way it can be read by so many different groups, in, in, is this, this is something that really did strike me. If you look at the book of Revelation and you say, who goes into the lake of fire? And Revelation says, ah, oh, well, it's the dogs, the filthy, the evildoers, the people who, who lie, the sorcerers, the, the, the sexually promiscuous people. 
you know, sexually immoral people. So who is that? I mean, these are not very specific. It's almost like hate speech. It can fit almost anyone you don't like. <laughs> but if you look, say, at the New Testament uh, story that Jesus is said to have spoken about the kingdom of God, it's in the Gospel of Matthew, right? the parable of the sheep and the goats. And Jesus is asked, who will go into God's kingdom? And the answer there is very different. He doesn't say the filthy, the dogs, the evildoers. And that's why this gets applied to people on both sides of the same controversy. But in that story of Jesus, he says, he talks about the person who feeds the hungry and clothes uh, the person who's naked and visits the people in prison and cares for the sick and shows compassion. They are invited into God's kingdom. And the people who withhold compassion are not. So it's a very different picture. And this one, you see, this can be applied very differently. Yes? Am I right to think that the vocabulary of the last Bush president comes directly from this book? I think much of it does. I mean, the shock and awe operation, the Emily. Viewers. The evildoers, absolutely. And you see, when, even when he spoke about the axis of good, uh, the axis of evil, right? So I thought to myself, now what does that tell you? That puts our president at the time, George W. Bush, at the head of the axis of good, yes. right? So you have good and evil in the universe, and you have the people that have to be annihilated because you can't negotiate with evil. You have to try to kill them. Um, before they get you or whatever. So that is what this kind of classification can do, right? It's, it's uh, much of that vocabulary, we, I, we are told, comes out of this. And I think that's when I started to think about how it's being applied. Yes. And then I realized it's, it's a lot more than, than a one-sided issue. It's, it's got a really rich history. I mean, but you could practically tell the hi history of Christian churches throughout the world in terms of the way they read this book. I wish I could do that, but I just took a tiny sample. <laughs> so. One more question about that shock and awe. I want to stay with that. Yes. I, I want to ask you, it's a, ver it's a version <laughs> of that question, though, about um, foreign policy. Foreign policy I'm imagining someone mining this book for just that kind of language. Uh, do we imagine that's actually going on, or is that conspiracy, or do we think people are actually sort of really looking to this book to sort of glean something that's relevant for domestic, for foreign policy, like how we treat other nations? What do you think? I mean, it, it would seem to me, but it just sounds conspiratorial. That's why I'm approaching it. You know. Well. <laughs> but, I don't think it's necessarily conspiratorial to give a religious interpretation to a political situation. Okay. I mean, but certainly many people do see the world that way. I mean, that's the way it's been read. However, you know, in a different perspective, you can see it differently. I recently read a book uh, called God's Holy Armies about, uh, about the Crusaders in the 11th century going to destroy the Muslims. And they were doing it at the instigation of the Book of Revelation. So, you know, they were God's holy armies, and, and that's how it was played. So it just depends, I guess, whether you're in that, in that group that's possessed by that conviction that propelled the crusade or in whatever other crusades or, or, or campaigns people have, because it also is used in very different ways to talk about justice. Well, the reason I'm thinking of that, too, is because it seems that the imagery of this book seems to endure. It just has... For some people, it does have a kind of contemporary uh, resonance to it. I mean, you read it, and it doesn't seem like an ancient book. I mean, there's a way that yes. you can mine it for, uh, particularly kind of imaginings about things going on in the world. Right? You know, that's very interesting, Wallace, and I was thinking a lot about that. I was thinking, how do these, see, I told you that I started with the question, how does religion still so deeply move many people in the world? And I think it has to do with, the emotional power of it. I don't mean that's to reduce it to that. But 
But I was reading the work of a neurologist who says that the survival instinct is very deeply connected with, with our emotions and with our dreams. And, and this, is, this appeals very deeply to emotional roots. I mean, the monsters, the terrifying beast, this hideous woman, uh, the whore, uh, the, the, you know, the sort of whole picture of this battle of Armageddon. I mean, those are images that, that any child could imagine. Uh, and, and I think they could come out of, quite spontaneously, out of the way people dream. Um, and, and therefore, they speak deeply to people on a, on a very emotional, deep level. Anyway, thank you very much.